Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of the Nurtured by Nature podcast. Today I'm delighted to be joined in conversation by the lovely Molly Ellis. Molly is the wildlife artist behind the brand The Wild Felter, based in the south of Ireland. During this inspiring episode, we pondered how sometimes the most important thing isn't knowing the answer, but simply being prepared to ask the question. Molly shared how her love and relationship with nature only began in her 30s, but has now shaped her family, business and home, where she has utilised renewable energy, the rather unglamorous sounding post-consumer waste packaging, and created a haven for wildlife by allowing nature to take the lead in rewilding her garden. Well, thank you, Molly, so much for joining us today. Perhaps we can get started with you telling us a little bit more about how nature has been part of your journey in your life so far. So thanks, Fiona, for having me. Um, I was really actually excited uh, about this because it's become so part of our life now, um, where we kind of stumbled along for so long and um, and just kind of went, oh, I heard something and, you know, followed it through. It's now become something that's just dominated our conversation at home. So I actually love talking about it because I think that once, like my family, once they get fall on a little bit of what nature can actually be for them, um, I think it's actually addictive. So I love setting people on this path, you know, so I love to talk about this. Um, so I suppose I grew up in the city. Um, surrounded by absolutely no nature oh wow um, amazing <laughs> yeah, that's, um, oh that's that's great I love um, it's nice yeah. to have someone who you know has has found it sort of um against Respectful. all the odds I guess yeah, as well and, yeah I mean I would have been in my early 30s before I would have been able to identify some of the most common birds you know and I think people are shocked that you know this is a wildlife artist and she, she what like you know <laughs> So I was like, yeah, like I always loved animals. And, you know, I would have thought that every kid comes along and knew that dock leaves, you know, cure nettle stings and you make magic potions. And if an animal comes along, isn't that lovely? I just presumed this was it. And I grew up in the city and any any chance I could get out of the garden, I was making magic potions like everyone in the 80s. <laughs> what you did because, you know, there was no YouTube. And um, the nearest thing to wildlife was the local university UCC which had a nice river and a little bit of trees around it and that was it um very fortunate enough that a cousin of mine a friend of mine lived out in the countryside and it was very typical of us to throw on a pair of shoes like not even wellies pair of shoes a backpack and be sent down in the stream for the day (laughs) and you would walk for miles in the stream with your lunch in your bag and go for it I mean like to think to think of me sending my six or seven year old out now go off in the stream there for the day you know yeah and, and this this was it and it was like I remember going blackberry picking for the first time and I went what's this you make jam out of this yeah and I came from a house where this wasn't the normal you know we were very much an urban family and I think what happened is I had a love naturally of animals but my my introduction to nature was so memorable because it was so different than my own life um so if as a child in the in the city I came across a bird that had fallen out of the nest or an urban fox my I I just couldn't walk past I couldn't um and and that never left me and animals became something really important in my life my own mental health my own sense of self so I went to art college and I always had a dog and I was living in a flat and I had a dog and I had to walk the dog every day because I was in a flat and you know, this and, you know, I'd walk in the city and I was living in the lock and, you know, I'd, the birds were there and, you know, I'd go with the bats would be there in the evening. And I just always was like, I was the bat because I have curly hair and the bats of dust would flick off your hair. And <laughs> oh, wow. freaked out. I was like, I better wear my hair down when I go for a walk. You know? <laughs> so and, and it was just these moments and, you know, life went on. And I think in my late 20s, just, you know, I just said, I want to be in the countryside. I want to be in the countryside. I'm done with urban living. And you know, I, I didn't really understand farming and, you know, monoculture, what many people talk about. I just wanted to be outside. I wanted to be by the sea, by nature, the roar of nature. And I just knew it was healing and that any aspect I'd ever dealt with is 
I knew it needed to be around me and I needed to be around it. Yeah. And at the same time, I left my career and I set up being self-employed artist. Um, and I moved into the wilds of Kerry where I met my husband. And, <laughs> you know, he's very technical um, and, you know, grew up around that beautiful raw landscape his whole life. And, you know, he loved seeing it in dramatic, you know, phases. But I suppose you know, I, I showed him something different and he showed me something different. And, you mm. know, um, so yeah, it, it all came quite late, you know, yeah. um, and, and that's actually exciting that I wasn't born into it. It wasn't this something that I, you know, it just actually followed me and I followed it. And yeah. I think that's really, that's really good because that means you can start at any time and it can, it can actually, at any time in your life, you can stop and go, actually, no, this can, this can actually change me. This, you know, I think that's that's actually exciting you know yeah, you hear that that's, you, yeah. that's, that's yeah, amazing is I think and then I think that's important as well because I think sometimes people feel like if um you know they haven't done something all their life or they haven't done something and in their childhood it's too late and they can't and actually it's really inspiring to hear that you know you you had this sort of connection with animals but actually you've jumped in like you know yeah. with you know both both feet and everything your whole life is and and it's now such an important part of your life as well. It's, it's, it's really inspiring. You know, it, it actually changes how we get up in the morning here. You know, um, you were asking me about the garden and stuff. And I suppose before that, I suppose we, we were living in Kerry and we loved it. And we just couldn't stay there for various reasons, family reasons. And um, um, when we moved back to Cork, we were renting and we rented in North Cork and North Cork, if you've ever been, has done real estate and just woodlands and forests and walks and rivers and reserves. And we were just like, just bowled over by nature here, you know? And we said, right, we need to find a place that has a bit of that, but some of the reasons we needed, we needed to be near a motorway. We needed, you know, economic yeah. reasons, yeah. You know, reasons and services reasons. So we were very lucky. We found a one bedroom house. And at the time we had one child and we were planning another and we found a one bedroom, 200 euro cottage in North Cork. There you go. Um, with an, uh, what, what's called a postage stamp house, which is where the cottage is on the corner of the, an acre. Okay. Yeah. A shy acre. And we're kind of in a lovely farmland area. And so we got that and we moved in and we had no money for a long time. And baby two came along. We lived basically in a one bedroom house for three, four years and saved. Oh, wow. So wow. even though we've been here a few years, um, the rewilding of our garden has kind of only happened in the last 18 months and nothing got to do with COVID. We just needed to build an extension. So, um, you know, we knew we had this part, like we moved in and there was actually a little bit of like this. We're very lucky. There's a mature native hedge here and some lovely trees. Um, but we knew we had to dig up for septic tanks, extension. We couldn't live in a one bedroom house. But also it was heavily reliant on fossil fuels. Okay. And that's where my husband comes in, in that, you know, he had been, he's tech, he's, he's all about tech. And he would have done a lot of research on climate change where I was, I was like, oh no, nature, nature and me and climate change didn't, ha hadn't actually made those two leaps for me okay. yet or yeah. him. And he was more technology and climate change. And I was more, well, nature and animals. And, um, or we were on fossil fuels and we had to change that. And we came to this crunch where we were moving in here, there was fossil fuels here, we needed a new car and we went electric. And it was a time no one was going electric. And I kind of looked at him and he said, this is where I want to go. I think this is actually really important about climate change. And I would go for it. But I didn't really care, you know, I was yeah. like really happy if you go for it, you know? Um, and we, we moved in here and we had to replace the boiler and we said, we could, but we didn't we weren't ready to extend and I think this is why I'm kind of going on about this is we had a point where we had to save for what we were going to do yeah but if we had put in another oil boiler we were stuck with that for the next 15 20 years yeah, yeah. and yet the grants especially at the time wouldn't allow us to put in a heat pump because it was not going to be efficient mm -hmm. and so we had to pull the full whack and we had mm -hmm. to make that decision knowing in two years time we would have been ready but it would have been too late if we had we couldn't live without heating for two years so <laughs> we put in a heat pump and we were very lucky we capped it off we put in we oversized it for what we were going to build and we put it in and we made it work for ourselves and we had an electric car we had no solar we weren't on light rate we made it work for ourselves and we had made those decisions and my husband Shane was talking about climate change I was talking about nature and we just knew we just knew 
that we had to, we had we had an opportunity to make a stand within our own lives yeah. and that was really when it just went insane for us and we went what if what if we could decarbonize our home what if we could decarbonize our life what if we looked at the garden and rewilded it what if we could grow our own and all these questions and we have two young children and we both work and you know, what does this mean for us and we had no answer um so we we built an extension we still have done nothing the old part we put in massive solar panels which we didn't have any money really so we put in we put in the um the wiring okay. and we had it and we saved and saved and saved and then we put in the solar panels do you oh, know what I mean wow. we put in all yeah. the mechanics do you know what I mean I think and, and that's that's I mean that in itself is is quite an achievement in like your commitment to it and being like okay it's not something we can do now but it's something that we want to aim for and you know you prioritize saving up for it and then at the moment you could you you put it in and and that's that's also I suppose, a, I suppose I'd like to point out we have a porch that's so drafty in the old part we just have that green air tightness tape taping it off because we have no money to fix it right <laughs> and you know because we we had made decisions what was important and the old cottage we have touched nothing the place isn't painted we're like here for two years this is not where our money has went you know we made very active choices to have the the, the fundamentals of where we live correct if it not if it's not pretty that's fine but, you know that that was good with us this is where we this is if we don't do it now we're stuck yeah. so i think for us what came is if we don't do it now where what will 10 years look like we can't go backwards so we you know we have this tiny crawl space in the extension um so the wiring had to go in it wasn't a proper attic it had to go in and um, obviously we had electric car we wanted to go second one but we had zero money and a family electric car at the time it was crazy money and second hand didn't exist yeah. and actually a year around now Probably next week, a year, I picked up a 191 electric car that was affordable for me. In that, um, my what I was paying on diesel was the same as my loan for the car. Oh, okay. Except I got a two-year newer car that was higher rent. And then um, by this yeah. time, you you had your solar panels on on your house, so you. And you yeah, I suppose you know we had done a summer of solar panels where my husband was taking his electric car to work. We had all the solar. I get text message, turn on the washing machine, you know, we've got all the solar. And I had a diesel car outside. So we were like, what if we had an electric car taking that? So it, it kind of all catapulted. And I, I'm going to revert to it a bit, you know, because it's about nature. And I suppose we, we have, we can say we've decarbonized. That's fabulous. It, it was not this full on plan. It was, oh, no, we need a boiler. What do we do? <laughs> you know, and we thought. Well, what if we do this? This might work. Or we Google yeah. or we YouTube. And then it was like, well, our car is terrible. What do we do? Well, we can go for a hybrid or a plug-in or whatever. What does that actually mean? Or we can check out YouTube and po podcasts and go, what would the finances look? Yeah. Is it the same money? Okay, I have to spend a thousand euro in two months' time to, to put a new something in my diesel car. I could take that thousand euro now and know that if I'm servicing electric car, it's only 140. Yeah. you know I, and you know so we made financial decisions as they came along and we used the savings up. so we are now at, after four years decarbonized I can list a hundred flaws but we did not go on January and go that's it we're walking in it's all perfect <laughs> you know we have done this we have certainly done it backwards we've certainly done it wrong we've certainly done it you know on YouTube but yeah like the main thing is we stumbled and that's fine because yeah. we've actually we're so proud that we were managing this you know and we we made do and I I think that's okay that there is a culture at the moment of not making do everything has to be you know with a big bow on it and I think that's okay not to be perfect you know. yeah it's yeah, about it's, it's about doing okay. and that's the thing isn't it it's about doing what you can do and and you know and at the time that you can do it and you can't necessarily do everything all at once all in one go but you can do yeah. But it doesn't you know, have to be perfect either. It yeah. doesn't have to be perfect either. You know, it's okay that it's not perfect. That's that's because you're actually just trying something and it takes people to try things. And then you get that information, you pass it on to the next person, and they might do a better job than you in six months' time. And go, hey, I found this thing, you might like it. <laughs> that's really cool. And and one of the things I found on this journey, which is unique, is 
every person who has done something like this is obsessed with talking about it and sharing their knowledge. <laughs> get people who are just so happy to share it because it's yeah. been a journey they're so happy they're really eager because like I mean you can go on Twitter right and anyone trying to put their head up on the parfus on the environment is just getting slated right yeah. and if you don't respond you spend three weeks just looking at the comments you will realize there's no need to respond because you'll never win this argument yeah and and if you step back and go this is I don't need to prove this to you I'm doing this for me because yeah, yeah. I'm doing this. I don't need all the facts and stats. I don't need to remember them. I don't need to prove the payback. I'm doing this because I feel it's right. I've, I've researched. I haven't had a spreadsheet, although my husband might. Um, <laughs> you know, and I know that what I'm doing is probably the best that's available for me right now. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah, I and think that's, that's important, it. isn't it? It's just to do the best you can. Yeah. And then in the future, you might find something better but it you know it's you've done something in the interim isn't it that's that's the difference is you've taken some action even if it's smaller or less perfect or whatever it's you've done something and that that feel that in itself is empowering and it takes you down this path and like you said you Mm -hmm. meet other people and they give you other ideas things you wouldn't even have thought of or considered and yeah, and it's, it just becomes a, a fascinating journey, doesn't it, that you, you it embark is. on? It, it's a lovely journey. It, it's one of reawakening. Um, I, I really feel that, you know, you can go out and just feel that you've achieved something um, and be proud. And I, I mean, you know, we myself and husband would often talk about that, you know, going, you know, like, you know, you don't, you know, go, well, I did this. It's not that. It's like, I've actually done something that we're proud to raise our children in that we can say you know what we've trained them that we try not to buy plastic toys or whatever and you know I know we're in you know toy shops and we get some funny looks because of what we say and whatever I go I'm okay with that because we've actually kind of we're we're teaching them as they grow up that we're trying our best and that that's okay to try your very best you know and that and we're proud that we're trying our best because I would want my children who try their best to be proud when they've achieved something so why shouldn't I be proud that I've achieved it um but we we were talking Fiona briefly um you know I feel that nature and the environment is so circular and life is circular and you know in my love of animals it always gave me deep healing and you know self-employed and managing and we were doing all these projects and these conversations around the dinner table and I started going well that's kind of cool you know I'm kind of powering my studio from the sun today you know I'm going to say that to customers that's really cool and actually years ago when we were renting we were renting on um, my husband uh, built a, a small wind turbine oh, wow. and he yeah I, I remember I have this photo of him on top of like a re, like a demolished shed fixing the wind turbine before the day before we got married and um, obviously trying to get out of the wedding by breaking a leg but um, <laughs> but and we used to have to anytime we do maintenance we didn't bring our other friend who really liked wind turbines down because we needed a third a third physical helper yeah. <laughs> to come down for wind turbine maintenance we had this inverter and we used to run my old studio off it as a, oh. as, a, as, a, as a mad idea you know and it was like crazy stuff but this was his tech and I was like I love this oh my god I'm you know I'm sewing on solar you know or wind power so it was always that novelty and playing around factor and then when we're really set up here and my studio is run, you know, in a steep car price, I went, this is actually something I want to tell my customers is that when they're buying off me, they're buying off, some, a, a, you know, a factory, my kitchen. Um, that's decarbonized. That's actually kind of cool. And I had always kind of been into like bio cello and alternative cello. And I started kind of looking how I could improve that. And I went, well, I use this white backing board. I'm, I don't think that's very good. I wonder what's better. And I found post-consumer waste stuff. And I was like, I'd never heard of what post-consumer waste is. Because if you go into any shop, you're never going to hear, this is post-consumer waste. That <laughs> is it doesn't sound brown. very glamorous, does it? <laughs> you know, it doesn't. And it's brown, mottled, you know. And, it, and you know, um, a, a maker once told me, like, the brown paper reminds her of getting her chips when she was, like, six, <laughs> you know, in the 50s. And I was like, you know, for her, it's cheap and, you know, whatever. And, yeah. you, and I thought that was fascinating. I said, you know, there's this whole thinking on the aesthetic, yeah. you know, what is an aesthetic? And yeah. 
And anyway, I, I started, so I started to stop producing my tags on normal paper. I started insisting on um, recycled paper, post-consumer waste, biosalo, started getting really good contacts, started ringing suppliers and going, can you get this? And they're like, well, we might actually get that printed for you. Like I couldn't get paper fragile tape. Yeah. So Ecoland in Dublin started producing it and selling it. Oh, so nice. now you can buy paper fragile tape because I annoyed oh, much. But again, like, and they were like, that's actually really, why can't we get paper fragile tape? Yeah. You know, but they had their own tape printed and I thought it was lovely. I said, can I not buy one without your logo on it? You know? yeah. So, yeah. and, and, and like, I'm a small maker and I can just ring a company and they can produce it. And I'm like, this is crazy. Is, is this all it takes is a phone call? And it, that's I really, that's really powerful, I think, isn't it? Because I think sometimes there's, a, there's this sort of feeling that as an individual, we can't do very much. And actually, sometimes we don't try as a result, do we? And I think from that story, it's like, actually, you know, sometimes if it's as simple as just one person having the, the thought to actually ask rather than just it, saying, it oh, I can't no, get it. It's, I kind of emailed every crafter I knew and said, please annoy them so that you buy off them so they know there's a demand. Because obviously yeah. they've done me a favor by producing this, you know. And, and that's the other thing I found is I had found that company because of a beautiful artist called Cyril Riley who I had bought a print off and she had this beautiful backing board. And I emailed her, I was like, you don't know me, I bought a print. What's your backing board made out of? And she said, post-consumer waste from this company. Yeah. I went, thank you. Do you know, she just shared that information. Yeah. And, and, and that goes back is every person who's trying their best is so eager to share the resources because we want it to become mainstream. We want it to become easy because we know the struggle it is to get it there, to find that information, but also they're the underdog and the Irish love the underdog. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. so it's like, let's get this out, you know? And there's another beautiful artist, um, Ina Farrell, and she does lovely forests and landscapes as well. And I mean, I think we email each other constantly going, did you see that new recycled, you know, paper? Is that really environment? And we have those chats um because it's it's kind of a nerdy topic in our industry in the craft industry where you can get these supplies what is ethical what isn't and it's you know so boring to the majority of people but we have found this hub that we can talk and go you know I found something you're going to be really excited by it it's paper you know and <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know and surprise and and it should be an industry where it's cutthroat and competitive we're both artists you know who happens to wildlife and you know but we're not we're sharing and I, I think, think that's again yeah that's I think that's incredible that community is incredible you know and I think environmental communities are like that you know? yeah I think I think that's the thing isn't it I think it's um you know community is really really important and I think um you know it's it's like you know individuals small people small businesses coming together you know we c you can all lift each other up and it's not this sort of cutthroat dog eat dog is it it's it's actually you know there's there's enough for everyone and actually by working together you sort of empower each other and and you make the differences that you want to see and it is I I mean I I love buying from like local artists and smaller businesses because I think they often do put the, the values that are important to them and then you can align with them at the core of their business and they take the time to do you know to research these things and find these alternatives and you know and one of the frustrations that, that we do have is is these sort of large corporations are really dragging their feet on it and actually you know buying local finding artisanal brands that can be the solution to it can't it it, is it, it to... can and it does I mean the more you dive into this addiction of you know trying to do you know what you can you actually do go come here what are they doing you know why aren't they why aren't why why is it taking them 10 years to commit to something not even promising in 10 years time we'll have sort of gotten around to it and I'm like seriously like you know it took me a phone call you know yeah. like yeah. It's, it's not that it's not that hard and you know, we're talking about packaging and coming around and it's a bit like the garden came and we had that robot lawnmower and we had it on the highest setting to leave the daisies and we thought we were great. And then we were digging it up to do the extension and I said, I'm going to have to reseed it. I'm going to buy native lawn seed to the grass. I'm going to put that down. And then I went, what happens if we don't plug in the lawnmower? <laughs> and, and there was silence, you know, at home. And he was like, all right, oh yeah, well, fair enough. You know, it was grand. Yeah. And then suddenly we had a rewilded garden. I was like, right, how do I Google yeah. rewild your garden? Because I didn't know. It was just, what happens if we don't 
don't know, you know, what happens, you know? Yeah. So we had seed in and, and and then I kind of wanted some prettiness. So I was like, I'll just do poppies in one corner because it's bare. It's, you know, it was easy. I didn't have to dig anything yeah. up. So we did that and that was beautiful. And then someone said, oh, you know, you can dye things with, with poppies. I was like, no, that's fascinating. Oh, I used to love picking fuchsias as a child and mashing them up. I have kids, they love that, you know. <laughs> and and then Brexit and I was buying jewellery boxes in from the UK and I went, that's a lot of shipping. Hmm. I wonder, and it comes with this foam and I don't need the foam. I don't use the foam. I take it out and I dump it. And God, that's silly, isn't it? What can I, how can I package earrings? I can put them in bags. Bags are a bit boring. What if I bought cotton bags? What if they were organic cotton? And what if I hand dyed them from the garden? Isn't that crazy idea? What if my kids did it for me? Great, you know? <laughs> so, so, hmm, I think I'm going to rewild, but in that corner, I'm going to do poppy seeds and we're going to gather them or we're going to crunch them up and we're going to figure out how to do solar dyeing. And I was like, oh, that's a bit crappy. And like, because you put them in and you have to turn them every day and then you forget for a week and it's a bit smelly. And so I was like, oh, I went down to someone. I found this big aluminium pot and I found, I bought a book and they were like, aluminium pot and pots are great. And I was like, kids, we can throw things in this and pretend to be witches, you know? <laughs> and they were like, brilliant, mom. And I was like, fabulous. I was like, oh, guys. And you know, there we are. We're dying bags. So now all my jewelry is in hand dyed bags from, you know, my wild garden. And, oh. and then Yarrow came up naturally and someone said yarrow is amazing all year round for dying it was like, fantastic so now we have yarrow everywhere and then where i grew up then they're doing a dye project and someone had yellow yellow dyer's yarrow it's called and tansy and which i didn't have so they're like come out and help us weed for the day and we'll give you some dyer's plants it's like, fantastic so now i'm starting to garden as opposed to rewilding but dyeing plants you know, yeah. and her, it's obviously herbs. I have herb garden because it's yeah. just for cooking. So then we got offered a polytunnel. So we built a polytunnel. So now we've only literally got it up. So we've got tomatoes in there and a few bits. So now we're trying to grow. Um, no experience, you know, except the odd spot. But so, you know, we're talking about the circular bit. And so I went from, you know, the house, the extension, I had to, the decarbonizing, which then more went, okay, well, then I need to put a native lawn in and, I don't want to really cut the lawn and now then I want to grow certain flowers to dye packaging and now I'm going back to the packaging that I thought I had done with it that I was really happy I'm like what if there was no packaging at all you know <laughs> because hmm. so then a pop-up went in the website please click here for minimal packaging so if you buy a mug you don't get a box because the box goes in the bin you know you choose yeah what if I choose what if I just disrupted that again so it's never ending but it's fantastically never ending so I have spent now the last three weeks scratching the head going what would minimal packaging look like in a shop because they are a different entity than online yeah, yeah. and I, I don't know the answer right please send in all your answers to <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really going okay I'm really happy with this this is as minimal as it can be protective but there's other items that have a box and boxes are king in shops. But what if I didn't have a box? What, how could I make that king? Mm. How can I stand out? And I, I don't know the answer. I don't know. Um, but you're asking the question and that's, that, that, yeah. that's, the, that's part of the battle, isn't it? Is, is isn't actually, it? yeah, just asking the question, just putting it out there, you know, you know, just even, you know, just ruminating it on yourself or yeah. other people having ideas and yeah, it's, and, and price, you know, prices have gone up for materials. And if I can reduce materials, then thus I can keep costs, you know, down. So it all goes around and around. And I think I said at the start, you know, we made financial decisions um, always when we got an electric car. We had to, had to financially make sense. And the things we've done have always made sense. So even with Wild and Garden, I obviously don't have to import and pay open import and custom fees. You know, I'm making... Uh, I'm doing something that's a bit more labor intensive, but it's the thing I can do with my children. So I'm not saying it's, you know, if I had no kids at home, would I want to spend hours doing this? <laughs> it's a great way to get out in the garden, you know. Um, I don't know. I quite enjoy it. Um, you, know, you know, it, it just, it, it, it's related to my life. Yeah. Um, and my kids are kind of on the school journey now. And I really want to start talking about nature and teaching this in schools. And I reached out to someone, I think it's the ISSN network.ie, ISSN. I reached out to someone and he was like, absolutely, we go into schools, we teach this, we have 
people who can go and meet you. I'm like, they're not even in school, right? Like, like yeah, I have to kind of approach that, yeah. And, they, and he, he said, all you need is a champion. And oh, that really stuck with me. It's like, if you just have one person to champion it, you can change a whole, whole organization. So like if I, we have a shop, there's a bunch of local makers and we have a shop and it's called the Blackwater Valley Makers. And I do all the ordering. So I don't order any bubble wrap or sanity because I refuse to. <laughs> and that was it. I said, you know, here's lovely brown and white tape. And they're like, no one wants it else to take on the job of ordering. So done, we have a lovely yeah. eco policy. And that eco policy is Molly refuses to order plastic based items. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just a, it can be as simple as that can't it you know this is, this is the thing like we I think there's a there's a tendency to over complicate things isn't there as well and actually just you know just do what you can and start where you are and you know just it's it can be as simple as that it as can be as simple of I'm in charge of that I'm just going to change it you know um and I just think it's and and then I said like I reached out to that 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 gentleman Cody and um, on the ISSN and he was like absolutely when you're ready shout and we'll give you help I mean it was just a Twitter like private message you know and I was like because just people just so want to help they really want to help and I just love that I love that feeling um I've had people come up to me how did you roll wild your garden it's just really easy you just do nothing <laughs> You're like, sorry, what? I was like, yeah, you do nothing. And, you know, for your kids, there might be nettles. I said, I know they've not yet stung themselves because they know what a nettle looks like. Yeah. And they're fascinated by this. And and I said, I, I um, it's about kind of three quarters of an acre of wild. And they have like, you know, those battery cars for outside. And we, every year we change the path. So it's like a racetrack. <laughs> so um it's never just that you know you see those beautiful wild fields and it's that straight line which is really poetic ours is not like that yeah. ours is like form <laughs> meandering <laughs> it goes around the swing set around the trampoline around the polytone yeah. but every year it becomes a different garden for them which I think is fascinating and then we have a tree house built out of old pallets and we have the yarrow overgrown there and we have put scrap wood and tree stumps so they have to you know, beat off the arrow to get to the treehouse because <laughs> it's, it's just like four meters of jungle for them. And it's so now you're like, what? yeah, we're, so yeah. When, when they jump in the trampoline, it, it actually looks like they're jumping in a big meadow, which is mass, you know, and there's nettles around it. It's okay. It, it, it's that, actually, I think that's the thing, isn't it? Is it's like, I mean, I've, I'm not that old, I'm 40, but I remember from my childhood, you know, we used to go out and you'd get stung by nettles and you'd get caught on a thorn and you know you survived didn't you it was like you know you, it's it and it's part of nature and like you say and you get stung by a nettle and you try and find a dock leaf and you know isn't that the excitement isn't yeah. that excitement and I like we find moths here all the time and my oh. kids are so sick of me finding moths that you know I might find a hibernating one and, and we have a little spot in the shed for them and then I, every time I go into the freezer in the shed I get to see them and um I'm like guys what is and my six-year-old oh mommy's found another moth <laughs> so normal mommy's so excited <laughs> but isn't I mean that's beautiful as well when you when you talked earlier about your own um experience in the city and now like the the sort of circle that you've the journey you've come on that your children have just got this like completely different experience <laughs> and exposure to nature now um, thanks to and, everything and, you know kids when we have play dates and we have long grass obviously it's the best hide and seek um and every kid loves it every mm. kid loves it and I used to strim it once a year you know to you know you're supposed to cut it yeah. but then we got hedgehogs um so then we had to set up like a doorbell camera to catch the hedgehog eating so then we had to wake our children in the middle of the night to see the hedgehog <laughs> But then I couldn't strim. So then I had to get, I can't remember, what's that? A scythe? Is a scythe or something? Oh, a scythe. Yeah, a scythe. Yeah, yeah. Because you see there, this is not in my vo vo vocabulary going, oh, what is this? Like the Grim Reaper, you know? Yeah, yeah. No neighbor, you know? Yeah. Um, so now I have one of those things that I can't pronounce. And I'm there hacking it away going, I don't know what I've been doing. <laughs> you know? And, you know, I got this fantastic comment on Instagram. And, like, and will you... um you know leave it really natural and leave it grow and dead itself or will you cut it down once a year and I was like well I don't have anything to naturally graze it yeah but 
I also don't have really great hips, so I can only get through about a third of it at a time. <laughs> it's really, it's um, it's really hard work, Scything, isn't it? It is. it's, yeah, it's like so, very, very hard work. So, so like if you look, I get about a third done every two months. So I, I you know, I could really say, well, I always leave a bit for nature, but actually, it's my back is killing me. You know, because I've done about a third of it out of frustration, and I get like a third done in like two days. And I'm delighted, and I'm like gone for two months you know yeah. so it's not a like it's not a science you know I, I can see there's some yellow flower I must go down and it, it's coming up that I've never seen before absolutely the the wildflower lawn I seeded there's there's almost like two areas in our garden where one was dug up so I reseeded and one was what was there and actually what was there is slightly nicer the I, I don't know what the genetically modified grass seed when it flowers, it's actually stunning, <laughs> stunning. <laughs> the native stuff is kind of small, high, small. It, it's yeah. finding heat still. It's going to take three or four years, but there is stuff coming up that I did not sow. And there is a massive amount of new stuff coming up every year. And, I, and that's the one thing about rewilding is if you put down the flowers, they're the first splash in year one, year two is going to be so boring for you because yeah. it's just going to be grassy, you know? And it actually kind of takes the third year and you'll start seeing like um uh you know the the lesser trefoil and you'll see you yeah. know and all those lovely little things like self-heal and they're tiny and they're gorgeous and fumatory and, and these are just and you have to you have to actually look to yeah. find them yeah. and when you look you find insects and when you find the insects you find other things we have a barn owl coming to visit we've lived here four years the barn owl oh. lives two miles away we now see it regularly Oh, we have amazing. we have a bat. I presume there's two, but there's definitely one living down the end of the garden that did not live there last year. Yeah. So we have always had birds, and we've always supported that. But now, when you look out, you see the seed heads of the grasses, and they're like this because there's like five birds on it. Yeah. And they just pop up, and it's crazy. And you go out, there's something happening in that garden every I think, day. I think that's the that's the joy of it, isn't it? Is it's actually when you give nature that little bit of extra space, it it just surprises you, doesn't it? Like, it's, it's like it, yeah, it's you you never know, but it does. It grows, it evolves, it changes. It, um, uh, just this year, we got uh, ghost moths, and they are white, and some of the the male I always get this wrong um one of them is white and then the other sex is this red and the white ones go like this on the top of and if you google it wasteland my garden wasteland and I was like thanks very much google um, and they fly like this so if you went out at dusk in like the end of the summer it was like this light show of fairies it's the only way to describe it these little white tinkerbell angel like little things oh, wow. flying and then the red dude comes along and they're like we'll just hang out here for me you know which is lovely but like six o'clock I was like see you love I was out with that torch you know I wanted to see this this is amazing and then one day I heard this mental noise and I had seen um, maybugs or uh, cockatoofers again I don't have yeah, right. yeah. yeah this is all red I, this yeah. is not my language growing up so yeah. I'd seen one or two so I was obsessed with finding this maybug I couldn't find him and I kind of put up in forums they're like too late love you know I said I know but what else could it be a great diving beetle oh wow. I, oh my god and you're named it Bob and moved him in he was amazing <laughs> he was this side little oh my god just beautiful no one else thought so um and that's because I had done ponds and different water. And if you want wildlife in your garden fast, it's water. Don't yeah. move water in. And ponds are completely addictive. Yeah. No fish, ponds. And we built a pond. It needs to be like 10 times bigger by now. And I got an old cattle trough. Okay. And I made another one. And then I took down our water tanks because we don't have that system anymore because we decarbonized and they're not the pretty vintage water tanks they're the black plastic ones with the copper pipes <laughs> and they are now two water troughs and then there was two builders buckets that were ruined with cement they are now two water water features oh, wow. and then I have this natural dip in the garden which I dug up a little lower and I filled it with old rugs old carpets to make it even slower down and the ducks are doing their job at the moment there to make it really mushy and when the ducks are moved out of there, water irises are going in there. Um, and that's a bog pond because that's a different type of habitat again. And water, water, water 
neat and bushes, you're, you're good. You know, yeah. like, and they, and people talk about, you know, feeding the birds and I, I don't really, a few peanuts because I want to see them, but the seed heads do the jobs. There's yeah. so much seed head. Like, it's just all circular again. Like, yeah, you're out there, you're cutting a bit of grass or maybe you just don't want nettles right outside your front door, you know, and there's a bit of transplanting, but like it just all oh, comes so good. It's like it's waiting for you to take that breath, to take that step towards it and embrace it. And that's what I find so exciting. So like, I'm like, in, you know, outside with a torch, going, oh my God, he's gorgeous. And it's a little bug and everyone's looking at me. But like, I was not this person. I remember being given moths five years ago. Like, I can't touch this. And now I'm like, they're all my friends. I've yeah. lost my moth. But <laughs> it's like, you know, and my mother is looking at me, what are you doing touching it? You know, and I'm like, I know, it looks fabulous. I'm rubbing it. <laughs> so it's like... <laughs> but it, 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 you know, it's crazy how it's changed. It, it's, and it, all it was is stop cutting the grass. Maybe I should put in a pond. You know, it was these little thoughts. Um, yeah, and, that, and that's the thing, isn't it? Just a little step. Like, just like, I mean, I, I don't, because uh, you're in Ireland, but in, in the um, England here, we have a, one of the wildlife charities do something called No Mo May, which yes, is basically encourages people just you know for the one month of may to just let their their grass grow and then invariably it sort of rolls on and they get excited and they realize and and it is it's, it's as simple as that isn't it and and then not being too excited to clear up as well <laughs> just mm -hmm. you know embrace the wasteland <laughs> and then, it is yeah. um like i was picking fallen apples we have lovely mature apples here here trees here i can't use them all and so I put a crate outside my door with a sign going free apples. Um, and I was picking some fallen apples for the ponies because when you go on a walk with kids, you know, you feed the ponies. So, and I was like, that's a funny looking leaf. And there I was holding a frog. And I was oh, like, oh wow. God, you know, like this is crazy. And I was like, we haven't, you know, we've had pools now. This is so exciting, you know, and like we've had a blue tit in our post box. So we had to put a sign up in our post box going, you know, out of use. And we had, we had put a little camera to see him. Um, mm. And we had a camera, you know, like security camera and there were starlings. So the camera got moved slightly so we could see them fled. You know, we were like the stick one night moving it so we wouldn't dodge it. So that we got to see the starlings fled, you know. So no security, but the starlings were yeah. fabulous, you know. Well, you have a whole flock of starlings for security oh, we, now, might we? Oh, we have, yeah. <laughs> and they can make that big carla, yeah, carla, yeah. yeah. so, um, yeah. so yeah, so we have like resident fox, pheasants, um, two hedgehogs, um, we have your frog. Your barn owl as well now. The barn owl who's down the road, I can yeah. see his house here, who comes patiently. We see him kind of, he scopes us out. We have at least one bat. We have my missile thrush is back. Um, in the last few weeks mm -hmm. um do you know like obviously the robins the wrens I could actually walk in the garden and tell you where they nest you know and it's it's nuts it's just nuts and it's so exciting it's so exciting it's so rewarding um, and all it took is not cutting the grass and I you know and if you really need a bit of color you can plug plant verbenia or oxide daisies or you know and yeah. like I do have a strip where I garden um, and most of that comes from three or four friends and we split plants so you're not buying plastic and if we do we share you know and seed sharing you know I, I was telling you I left apples at my door I got a knock from someone who said I really enjoyed your apples all summer here's some jam I made for you I was like oh, thank wow. you you know I didn't know yeah. this person oh, and there's such a community that can be there in this modern society if we just release what we think and rephrase our own minds a little bit, um, I think yeah. there's an opportunity to to be something happier. Yeah, it's good. I think that's the thing, isn't it? You 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 grow, you start by thinking you're growing something for nature, but actually you find you grow yourself in <laughs> untold ways, don't you? It's just yeah, yeah, and. My kids last year, they would have went to school um, a little later and we used to spend an hour in the garden every morning. And it was just amazing. So we got up 35 minutes earlier to spend time outside. This year they're split. So myself, the child that's much later, we go for a walk down by the river and the forest with the dogs every morning. 
So it's amazing. So every morning, hail, rain or snow, we get outside. Mm-hmm. And, and I, people are like, before school? I'm like, before school. Mm-hmm. That's what we do. And we're outside and it could be making mud potions or it could be sweeping the polytunnel um, mm-hmm. or it could be going down to the river and throwing stones into the river. You know, it, it can be. But that was something that came to me last year. I was like, before school, I want them outside. It set, it sets you up, doesn't it? It, it just so, it's just yeah. a beautiful way to start the day is just to be, and I guess it you sort of tap into yourself, don't you? And you feel calmer and just it it sort of you know heightens so many amazing senses, doesn't it? Like curiosity I, and I observation. I'm a hammer. I'm not a camp person, <laughs> but <laughs> like what what like I'm very high energy. And I suppose a lot of people who do rewilding and stuff seem to be very meditative and I'm not that personality again, but I can have a, you know, a tough start in the morning and 20 minutes outside, half an hour outside. And I'm actually in really good form for the day yeah. and it can change your mood. And I, I've always found that is it can actually center me where I'm quite, you know, my brain is always like this and it actually focuses me. And I think that's really interesting for me who's not that typical person that you see, you know, in, in nature or doing that. I'm actually that bumbling person. I'm quite clumsy um, I'm loud. Um, and I'm that, that antithesis that you associate with it, you know? And yet for me, it's completely centering. I'm not gonna say grounding because the idea with that is that you're very calm and I'm not very calm. I, I actually get so much good energy from being outside and the texture, like, like just touching grass and I was talking about the shop we have and this year because I do the displays in the shop every single display has been centered around my garden where I've cut grasses I've cut foliage I've cut dried flowers and we have designed and themed it around that so we did a Christmas shop and yes there's lights but the entire thing is um brown bracken and rose okay. hips. yeah that's everywhere yeah. so that's our Christmas decoration it's nothing bought it's it's handmade craft and nature yeah, and it's beautiful and it's different it's different and it's yeah. just so if I'm doing a window I just go out in the garden I go oh that looks beautiful what if it was just like hung herbs hanging upside down and we just center the theme around that and it's the garden that inspires mm-hmm. and and it, it and it can be it can be simple isn't it I think that's, that's <laughs> really like a theme that's come through while talking to you is is it doesn't have to be complicated you know keep no. it simple and I mean, and that sort of touching touching on Christmas and and with Christmas coming up, it's I mean that's something that I've I've sort of embraced more the last few years is you know just making use of the beautiful foliage that's around to you know and that that's again an, another great way of um, just reducing your your impact on the environment. You know, you're not buying things, you're not you know creating waste that that doesn't you know once it's you're but did you plants and seeds and posting envelopes of seeds to people is just actually crazy lovely to receive in a post. Uh, like it's just really nice, you know. <laughs> and and then you send it on in two years' time, it's you know, you're giving it to someone else. And isn't that really nice? So yeah. I might go, you know, to a neighbor, I go, you remember, you know, those daisies you gave me? Well, they're in this county, this county, and this county yeah. now yeah. because I split them, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's lovely, you know, that's yeah. really nice. You're digging up, you're sharing, you're not, there's no plastic waste, there's no nothing, you know, it's really, you know, it's really just nice. It's nice to go here, here's a plant, here's, yeah. here's yeah. something that's going to actually bring something happy into your life and your home, you know, and like I've said it, like I've had, I have, the house is kind of on just shy of an acre and between the house and stuff, we've a good half acre rewilded. But I mean, you don't, like someone once said to me, it's not a meadow, it's a patch. And I was like, thanks, you know, that's a bit derogatory, like, you know, so this is this is my world, you know. And and I was like, actually, no, it's it's a meadow to me because I get lost in it. And if you get lost in three pot plants in your balcony, is that not is that not your patch? Is that not your meadow? You know, because if you go outside and you rub your hands and you've got native grasses or you've got oxide daisies or you know, anything that supports wildlife. And you can go outside and you can rub your hand off it. That is your world. That's your meadow because you can transform yourself. But you're also making a stand going, well, I don't have a garden, but I have this. Mm-hmm. And it's the same if you do it in your workplace, whether they're relawning something and you go, actually, can we just not do that now? Can we not blow the leaves? Can we not, you know, can we, can we just 
can I take over that little strip outside the car park? Can I plant a few, three trees there instead? And, you know, people don't care if you're willing to do the work. They're like, yeah. Fran, you know, yeah. you really don't mind. No, you know? no that, and that's the thing, isn't it? It's them quite often someone's just relieved someone else is going to take responsibility, aren't they? They're like, oh, it's a job I don't have to do. Crack on. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And yeah. I, I, and I, the other thing I feel that if you're doing these things, there's a bit of a fear or an overhanging that you have to prove it's the right decision. And I don't actually, think, I just think step away from that. Mm. Do it because you know it's a step, you know, um, you know that it's a step. It mightn't be 100% right, you know, yeah. but that's okay too. Yeah. Um, but know that it's, 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 it's a step. And you're, you're moving the needle, aren't you? That, that's yeah. the thing. Is It's just, you know, you don't have to go from zero to 100. You know, yeah. it could be you get to 0.25 or, yeah. you know, it's, or one or 10. It's just, yeah. just, ha- just doing anything. Um, and I think you can just open your mind and open other people's minds and open conversations. And I think... I think, look, personally, I think we need to move faster than that, you know, um, but if everybody moves a little bit, the people who are moving faster because they've been doing it a while will absolutely share. And those little steps will become much faster very quick. Yeah. And and I, I, I think, you know, I, I really think nature is waiting in the wings. I really think it's still and it's just waiting for us to allow it. And I think we find it hard to relinquish control. And if we relinquish control to it, you know, it'll actually just come. But we have to take that step of stepping back and going, you know, show me what you have, <laughs> you know, and it will show you, it will show you, you know. But I think we have to say we're not in control, but I can I can manage this. I can help manage it to help it along, you know, but, you know, by plug planting or sharing seeds. Absolutely. What you can control is you can help others on their journey but you can't control nature. And once we actually realize that, I think it'll all happen much faster. Those small steps won't seem so small. And and and, and small steps don't have to be small steps. They can be a small thing, but a big mental change as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I think that, that that sounds like the perfect way to round up, actually, Molly. I think that's just, just been beautiful. And yeah, just remembering that, like just a small step, however small it feels to you, just do something and mm-hmm. then enjoy where the journey takes you exactly exactly thank you so much Fiona for having oh, me perfect thank you Molly it's been oh, it's, really been, appreciate. it's been amazing really really Great. lovely thank you so much for listening to the Nurtured by Nature podcast I truly hope this conversation has brought some hope and inspiration into your life I would love to have these messages ripple out across the world So if you can, please share this episode with your friends, leave a review on your favourite podcast player and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. I would love to hear from you, so please feel free to connect with me on the links provided in the podcast description. But most importantly, thank you so much for being a part of this journey with me. But don't forget to simply get out there and enjoy the natural world.